Hi, this is just a note from me ahead of this excellent video recording from the End of the World Reading Club's June meeting discussing the fifth season. You may notice during this video I'm doing a lot of scratching my head and my nose and touching my face in what seems like a compulsive manner. I suffer with hay fever this time of year and I was just really allergic that day. So I've tried to edit out the worst examples um, please don't be too alarmed and um, that will explain some of the jump cuts as you go through the content. Hope you enjoy and please do join us online for the July and further meetings or catch up here on YouTube in the future. Hi everybody and welcome to the Cosmia Festival's End of the World Reading Club um, and this is the June 2020 meeting and we're going to be talking about this amazing book The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemison. So we're going to kick off, I'm going to throw some comments there into the ether for the next hour or so um, but I've got a machine here, um, I can see your comments um, so if you've got things that you want to talk about, things that you think we should be sharing, then leave them in the comments and I'll weave them into the story. So I thought I'd start with um, the end of chapter one, I suppose, because um, I think this is a framing of the story which is really important. But this is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends for the last time. I think that's a really powerful start to this story um, and we'll revisit, I think, those world ends uh, as we go. The Fifth Season um, is a novel by an American author, N.K. Jemison. Um, it's not her first novel, but um, it was the one that really pushed her through into kind of mainstream appeal. Um, and it won the Hugo Award in 2016. It was published in America in 2015 and then in the UK uh, the following year. It is part of a trilogy, the Broken Earth trilogy, written as a trilogy, um, and each of those novels won the Hugo Award in subsequent years, which was an uh, unprecedented achievement. Authors don't tend to win three anyway, uh, but to win three with consecutive books as part of a sequence was just astounding and really put her on the map. Now she's a notable for many things, um, one of which is that she is a black woman writing in a genre that's traditionally been dominated by white men. Um, so it, she has a very different take, I think, on the tropes of fantasy um, and science fiction, and we'll get into maybe where this book sits on that spectrum a bit later on, um, but has a, a really different perspective than a lot of the work that I've read before and that you might have read before. She's definitely less in thrall, and she talks about this somewhere in an interview, to that kind of Western European vision of um, this Western European vision of kind of Arthurian knights and kind of all those ideas about courtly manners and the rest of it, um, which is really refreshing. That doesn't tend to be the kind of, of fantasy that I'm interested in, um, but. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later as well. So the author was a psychologist until she became a full-time writer. Um, but one of the things that's really notable, despite the fact that this was incredibly successful, she still had to do a crowdfunding campaign so she could move to become a writer full-time. Even writing Hugo winning books wasn't, uh, world winning books wasn't enough. Um, she also apparently writes about 3,000 words a day. She writes a lot of books. Um, they all get great reviews. So someone to really check out um, if you like this one and you want to find out more work. So we picked this book, The Fifth Season, um, for this month because it is a post-apocalyptic survival movie in book form in some ways, um, which was very on brand for the End of the World Reading Club. But in the month since we announced the book, a lot of stuff has happened which has reframed some of that conversation um, because this is also a book about the black experience, about slavery, 
and about representation um, and it means that I think although we would have talked about those themes anyway they've got an additional relevance and interest to the world that we're living in right now there's these two massive themes that we are being confronted with and people are being challenged on on a daily basis and I think that's brilliant and it's a great opportunity to talk about this book in this context uh, and to get into maybe how that um, how we can read it now that maybe we wouldn't have done even a month or two ago. Now the other thing I want to know is that this is a reread for me um, and that's it that's important because I think it makes a difference so next month's book which I'll announce at the end is going to be fresh to me and there's an experience you get when you read a book new where everything is wonderment and you're kind of swept up in the narrative that's how I tend to read anyway but a reread you can really dig into some of the nuances and the framing of it now we're going to be spoilers for this book but we're not going to spoil books two and three in case you haven't read them yet um, but having read a trilogy and then going back you get an additional thing you you're not necessarily the bit of your brain that's reading isn't necessarily thinking oh what's um what do I need to do here what do I need to what's going on here who are these people you kind of know who the people are and you're focusing on what the story is trying to say. So I found this an incredibly rewarding thing to reread. And the fact that it's a trilogy, I've said before on this channel, I love big long stories. So that was a winner for me almost straight away anyway. So let's get into the story. And this is going to be spoilery. So this is the time to tune out if you don't want to know anything about these books. But the story is, ostensibly, the tale of three women in three timelines. Uh, Demea, Senite and Esun, I'm probably pronouncing all of those pretty wrongly. Um, a young girl, uh, a, a kind of young adult and an older woman. Um, and Jemison very wryly says, you know, it's, this is a kind of black woman with dreads in her 40s. And that is essentially who Esun is. So there's maybe something there about personal experience coming through all the way. Um, and there are little breadcrumbs dropped in, but essentially um, these are the same woman and it's her story being told from three different perspectives and three different time periods. Um, and normally um, there's a reveal, a kind of, but it's teased by little hints um, along the way that maybe these people are the same. And you definitely spot those, they're kind of klaxons on the re on the reread which maybe you don't get so much the first time um, because you're focusing on all the other stuff that's going on. So the story is of a young girl who is um, taken from her parents because she's special. She's got a special ability. She's an origin, which means... So everybody in this world has got a little thing uh, in their brain stem, which um, some people can use to sense um, and control energy in particular heat um, so this is volcanic eruptions and all the rest of it so the story is of a young girl who's taken from her family she's trained to control her powers and that's the young adult and the child of young adult experience senite experience is very much of learning how to use these powers and also learning the realities of the world in which she lives and then Essen's story is of someone that's escaped that system has tried to live normality and then things have happened and she's confronted with her past experiences and the reality of who she is. And then the story goes from there. The story is set in a place called the Stillness, which is a massive landmass on a world, um, which is controlled mostly by one kind of empire. Although it's not quite direct rule, um, it does have its influence over everybody. And this empire is um, seen as the kind of standard for people to be. They uh, rule by partly by fear, partly by economics, and uh, a lot of the action is centred on their capital city, which is pronounced something like Eumenes. I'm going to say Eumenes. You hopefully you know what I mean. Um, and this city is the kind of hub of everything, of wealth and power, and is where this training school is, where our hero, where our heroine goes to study how to become a trained origin um, and have all these powers. Now the story is interesting because it's not told by the women directly. This is something that I always wondered how it would work in stories and I never found one until hit this which did it. It's told in the second person. It's a really curious mechanism. So somebody, a mystery narrator, is telling our 
heroine. I'm going to call her Essen, just because that's who she ends up as when she can decide her own name. That's who she becomes. Essen is being told the story of her life by somebody else. And I think this is a really interesting choice because um, most of the characters in the story are black. And that's noted because quite a lot of characters are described in how they look and, and particularly in the genetic mix um, of how close they are to this ideal in the capital city and how much they are removed from that. Um, Essen herself uses the word mongrel a couple of times or she's said to be using that word in her own mind. But essentially the story is being told by somebody else and I think when you read all three of them I want you to think about who is telling this story and the who they are and what they might represent compared to the black experience and how that might have some relevance with the world around today. Now I'm not going to go too much into that because that's definitely too many spoilers for the parts two and three but I'm going to leave it there. So in this world of the stillness um, there is a fifth season. We've got the usual four and then we've got a fifth season where something cataclysmic happens. Now they're rare and at the back of the book there's a glorious appendix for all the different seasons but they're kind of like a biblical blight or a plague or something like that or a earthquakes. So we might equate them, no pun intended, to, um, to a geological epoch that's ended by something catastrophic. Although I don't think we've had any um, meteorites land and destroy all the dinosaurs or anything that they talk about anyway. So in this world, we have these um, mutants, I suppose you would call them, if you were thinking about it outside of this story, um, which has got its own connotations, who have this special power um, and people fear them because if they can't control it or they something happens, they can suck all the energy out of people, out of places, and to do something they can kill people as a reflex so they tend to be feared and they're controlled by characters called guardians um, and each of our um, origins has um, a guardian that is responsible for them that can kind of track them and control them and nullify their powers when they're in their presence so there's this element of them being having no agency and no choice in their lives and a guardian who controls essentially who they are, what they do. And the fulcrum where they train um, is this place where they're taken to as children, they're given a name and they're put to work. And if they can't do the work, then they are killed or worse. Now you might think, even from that initial description, there's some really um, interesting and obvious parallels with the history of the transatlantic slave trade and the uh, enslaved people and what happened to them, particularly in America. And I don't think anybody would say that that's not right there at the heart of this book. And that's the bit of the book which has really come to the fore in my reading re reading of this when I was initially thinking I'd be talking a lot about the kind of post-apocalyptic world that the story deals with, because the story ends with the end of the world. It ends with a character causing a cataclysmic event which is going to lead to the destruction of the world or of all life in the world. The world is ending, finally. Um, so what we kind of get from Essen's story is a post-apocalyptic survival experience. She has to leave her home, go on the road hunting down her family and, um, and then encounters all of these kind of apocalyptic tropes and ideas and concepts along the way. So that's all I'm going to do, I think, in terms of the outline of the story. I kind of don't want to give too much away because you either have read it or you're going to read it and I don't want to spoil it for you. But I have got a really good list of things here which I think we should be talking about. And we'll start, I suppose, as I was talking about post-apocalyptic stuff, with climate change. So the fifth season, for me, does represent... Um, and this is, in some ways, I suppose, a teaser for the other parts of the story, um, climate change, and particularly man-made climate collapse. The seasons are, in many ways, a proxy for that, 
Although, interestingly, they're not predictable. They're not something you can stop at this stage. People are just dealing with the consequences. It reminded me a little bit of some of the other stories that I've read where people are living in that kind of post-climate collapse world um, and they're having to try and just deal with things, be prepared for things. And there's some interesting takes here on how civilization might survive experiences where electronics disappear. So um, one of the key strands of this is geology. We'll talk a bit about geology anyway, but also about stone law. So the idea that if you've got things that you need to remember that can survive anything, you carve them in stone tablets and that becomes your experience, as well as a more um, historic kind of Greek tradition oral storytelling, um, which tends to sway into myths and legends. And really early on, there's that st the story of um, Shemsena, who, um, and the, the idea of how a story can be told and told from a, a, a perspective and things can be occluded and how the telling of a story and what you choose to include and not include can have a massive impact on how people build their sense of identity. Again, something that is really important and out there in the world right now. The other thing that I think we should get into talking about is is that um, take on enslavement and agency and freedom, which um, is really important right now with the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, I kind of don't want to get too much into all of that because it's not my lived experience and it's not really my place to talk about it. And I don't think that that's the only thing that this novel is talking about. But as somebody that's um, done some history training and that my day job is in that kind of world, um, I found it really interesting and really emotive from those side of things. When you look into the history of the transatlantic slave trade and the kind of post-slave trade in um, the former kind of colonies where, where enslaved people were left to work after abolition, and the black experience in America in particular. Um, there's so many parallels here between those different experiences and what people are, and what people find. There's so much in the novel that is about um, freedom and the struggle for freedom and the, the finding the ways of leaving behind oppression and trying to create a new world. Now, Alabaster, who is the one of the main characters, his eventual tortured response is to burn the whole world down. He's trying to be the cause of destruction. But the book also talks about other options and finding other paths. And dotted throughout the story are experiences of characters who've tried to find these other ways. And also um, reminders that in the past, in previous, before previous fifth seasons, people have found other models of doing this. And that the horrendous world in which these characters live, the origins, um, is not the only answer to this question of what do you do with people with disability and the world in which they live. So although it's quite a dark novel and there's some incredibly dark, emotive, horrible parts of it, I also find that there's some hope in there because um, there are characters who are trying to make a difference and at least finding small pockets. And the novel ends um, with Essen reaching a community which feels like it might be a model of how things work. Um, Sanai also finds a community where she thinks things might work, and it does for a short time. Um, but I suppose one of those messages is, although the, the empire and the population at large, the sands, and the there's an institutional control um, of these people. Um, the guardians, the, the slave owners, the, the slave masters, I suppose, as in a kind of historical parlance, they are a key barrier to making real change. And that you can, you can, and you have to maybe do the two things. You have to get rid of the control and also create models for freedom and that these two things might need to happen together and that there is a solution which isn't burn the world down because there's too much pain and nobody can cope anymore 
So I feel like there's something really interesting there. So something else that we definitely should be talking about is, is, the, um, is how quotable this book is. I think it's amazing. I think there's loads of passages here which are brilliant. Um, and I think that um, it's such a great literary experience reading this. Um, and there's, there's just tons and tons of bits in here which I would love to just quote and read to you. That's not necessarily what the reading club is about. Um, but one of those, um, a couple of those quotes that I thought I would just read out because I think they're going to frame our conversation for the next 40 minutes or so. One of them is about smiles, and smiling is an incredibly interesting part of this book. Um, I noticed that really on the reread, how many smiles happen and how complicated the relationship is between um, the people and their smiles and whoever they're smiling at and what that's trying to do. And really early on there's this quote, there is an art to smiling in a way that others will believe. It's always important to include the eyes, otherwise people will know you hate them. Now for me that does two things. One of which is that it um, it it makes me think about some of those um, stories about um, enslaved people and pretending you're having pretending everything's fine with a smile because if you don't smile something bad's going to happen. And that's not necessarily just about the historical context. I think it's got a broader relationship with how people deal with difficult circumstances. But smiling is the thing that is the easiest way of showing that you think that everything's fine for you. Um, and if you're being particularly cruel or bad to somebody and they're smiling, then maybe that person doesn't feel guilty about it. So institutionalizing smiling into a system of control rather than glumness is perhaps a way that everybody can just imagine that what they're doing is useful and important and the only way to be. Now the other quote that I pull out uh, which I think is really key for this story is um, it is a land of quiet and bitter irony. Now I, um, I've read a few interviews with the author as part of the prep for this and when I was kind of reading them and she's really funny her twitter feed is passionate and angry and also wry and sarcastic I think maybe as a British person as a stereotypical British person I love that sense of, of bitterness and irony and sarcasm that comes through this and I love that the there's lots of characters in here that inhabit that I think some of the relationships between characters um, Essen and Alabaster in particular or Senai and Alabaster is a great one because they they're full of this kind of like feuding but also they're not feuding and they're just being kind of yeah I love it all it's great it feels like a particularly rich um, strain there of British style comedy now however this did make me think about um, the broader idea of what is um, good behavior in this land of the stillness and what the sands has created as a model for how you need to behave and it's got some interesting connections I think with some of those other themes so rather like um, the stereotypical British Empire, I would postulate, um, there's a really passive-aggressive politeness that comes in. And I'm thinking particularly about the part of the story where um, our lead character goes to a harbour city where they've got a problem, turns out it's a massive problem, and her and Alabaster have this back and forth with the people that run the city who are incredibly rude um, and are treating them like second-class citizens which is kind of what society teaches them to do but at the same time society wants to pretend that it doesn't teach them to do this so you end up in this battle of passive aggressive politeness and i think this has a real link to that so the smiling the the politeness has a real link to um, the sense of Britishness and Englishness, which is you keep on smiling through and stiff up a lip. Um, Damien is told by her guardian, Shaffer, don't cry. Um, so, th and there's there's some really interesting links there, I think, um, between that side of things and the way that this empire operates and the way that it operates in terms of its political and economic hegemony as well which has got strands and links and relationships to the British Empire and the way that it reshaped the world um, as a tool for itself 
in the 19th and very early 20th and earliest century. So we also then have some of the things that I think it'd be useful to talk about, one of which is the stillness. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this world that's been created and the world building element of it. Something that I thought was really interesting and I really liked is that the world the world's not overburdened with detail. We get information when we need it, but it I think some fantasy can stray into just giving you more information than you need because so much thought and effort has gone into the world building it they kind of want to tell you all the stuff because it's interesting and it's important. Maybe some clever writers leave gaps that they can fill in later. But in some ways it doesn't feel like that for me here. Because uh, it really feels like um, when you read the trilogy that these are kind of being told as one story that's been um, chopped up into three manageable parts rather than I'm going to write a story on oh, then I better come up with some other ones. Because a lot of the thinking about this has been done and the very last bit of the book um, I think is an indication, I, I hope, of that. Now I could be completely wrong about how this was written. Um, it really is just the way that it feels to me. Um, but the world build, the world building feels really clever and real. Now I find there's something that I can't help myself doing when I read stories like this. Stories that are set in f kind of f things that could be futures. Is this our planet in the future? That's always my reaction. And I think probably authors mostly couldn't care less. They don't really want to necessarily do Planet of the Apes to stories like this but I like a story I think where that could be true so obviously there's a real difference here between human beings today and the human beings in this story which is the um, thing in their brain stem which allows them to kind of assess as it says here or control um, uh, the geology that's something we could evolve and this could be our planet the continents do shift they do change we don't know how far in the future this is. It feels like a very long time in the future. So I like this idea that it's it's a world very similar to our own, but also kind of not. Um, one thing that um, we probably need to talk about is whether this is a fantasy novel or a science fiction novel. Now, you might have a view when you read this first part, and it might change for you when you read parts two or three. Sorry, I'm gesturing because they a thing on the shelf there. I and I wonder whether um, this taps into that uncanny bit, um, which is that it's it it reads like a fantasy and it's structured like a fantasy, but really it's kind of a science fiction story in that you you could kind of explain everything that happens by advanced tech rather than not. So I've had a comment here um, from Stephen. When I read it, I thought that this was our planet in the future. There's a map in the book um, with that could be our Earth with all the continents mashed together. Yes, absolutely. Although I think if Game of Thrones has taught us nothing else, it's that you can have a map that very looks very much like somewhere in reality, but it isn't necessarily it. But yes, and I didn't mention that actually, Stephen. Thanks for reminding me. Um, I love a fantasy novel in particular that has got a map. And that it's also got appendices. I love the detail, I love the world building, as long as it's relevant. So yeah, I think you can go either way on, you can go either way on whether this is our planet in the future or not. And you can also go either way on whether you think that this is fantasy or science fiction. And so yeah, leave your comments and let me know if you've read only one or if you've read all three of them, because I think that does make a difference in how you visualize this world. Um, and probably tying into that, and I, I had this observation when I read it, and I thought, oh, am I just, is this my own reading that's coming into this? But when you, but the author herself talks about Stephen King. So this novel reminded me of Stephen King in a variety of ways, and she talks about the death of Stephen King in terms of fantasy and horror. And I think there's, there's a strand of Stephen King's way of writing that comes throughout this. I think there's a strand of Stephen King in some of those set pieces and there's very much some horror set pieces in the story. You'll know them when you come to them and I kind of don't want to get into all the details but there are moments where you feel like you're in a horror movie, like you're playing a, 
cutscene from something. And it's not as like a zombie post-apocalyptic horror, but maybe something like The Stand. There's definitely an element of that in these stories, I think, which is a world that's very much our own. Um, and maybe that taps into Stephen King's ideas of parallel worlds. Maybe this is a parallel world to our own. Um, not going to harm to other things too much. Um, but there's then there's also there's just a, there's another kind of Stephen Kingy vibe I think um, in there's definitely Stephen Kingy vibe in terms of strong women um, there's and strong women who have terrible things happen to them and something that I get a lot from Stephen King is revenge there's a lot of people motivated by revenge and grief and for me this story those are really strong totem poles in what's happening to people and what they do. And this makes it quite a difficult read. So Essen experiences grief right at the beginning of the story. Um, although it's at the end of her life, as we're, as we're told in the, in the novel. But it's at the beginning of our experience of it. And I think that's very important. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about how, um, how grief comes through this. And I, and I think particularly on the reread... I could, I could remember what she'd been through, what Essen had been through, and the other grief she'd been through, and the grief she'd been through with previous, with a previous child, and um, the stuff that happened to her specifically in the story, um, or what we know of so far in this book, and that she's already carrying all that with her, and then she gets hit with more grief at the beginning of the book. And there's definitely something there, and this kind of harks back, I suppose, to Alabaster and responses to institutional um, systems of control versus freedom, which is about how people deal with grief in the same way. Bottling it down, letting it out, um, channeling it into things. There's loads in this book that I, I think you can bring to it if you've got some personal experience. And something else that I, I noted, particularly on the reread, is words and language. I mentioned before how good the writing is, but a uh, luxury I think you can have when you do a reread and you have it, and you, I get very caught up in narrative, is you can stop and you can look things up. Particularly when you know you're going to be talking to the internet about it for an hour. And there were some really nice, either wry or interesting words, um, which I, which I thought brought more to the story when I knew about them, which was great. So I'll give you a couple of examples that I've got here. So the first one is Hewer. So we haven't talked yet at all about Stone Eaters, which I think are really fascinating characters. And I suppose I haven't talked about them much because in part, you get a lot more about them as you get into um, parts two and three, that it, they become a bigger part of the story perhaps. But Hewer's name is really interesting and Hewer's appearance is interesting. So maybe we'll talk about him together at the same point. So interesting in terms of when he appears and how he appears because he appears as a child, which is an incredibly cynical thing to do to somebody that's just lost a child, um, but probably also quite a clever thing to do because he needed to embed himself with Essen and her story, and this was the easiest way of doing things. But Hugh's name, um, it could mean several things, and it's a word that comes from a couple of different cultures. You can um, find it in Chinese, Vietnamese culture. But I also discovered that in Maori culture, it means friend or companion. So what better name for somebody than uh, who is going to be on this journey with our main character? But it's also got a duplicity to it because he's not just a friend and a companion. There's lots of other motivations going on beneath, which we're only just starting to investigate by the end of the book. Uh, the other one that really made me smile is Terimo. So this is the um, village where Essen starts her story in the beginning of the book. And um, I loved, and it talks about it in the book, I didn't have to look this one up, that it means kind of essentially quiet village in the middle of nowhere. It means quiet town. And I think there's something, I found that hilarious that it, that little joke is in there for us. Which this is someone that's literally fled to somewhere that's like, quiet middle of nowhere town backwater that's kind of what it what the village is called you like you couldn't pick anywhere that's better than that um, and the other thing the other place where words and language comes through is in terms of geology and rocks 
and in the um, in the in the back of the book in the acknowledgements, um, Jemison talks about the inspiration for the story being a kind of hmm, science creativity experience that she went on, um, where she got to kind of find out a bit more about science and plants and stuff. Um, and the geology and the rocks, people, which comes across really strongly in this, it comes across in the terms for um, origin, um, and it comes across in people's names. So the um, the fulcrum agents, essentially, so then they all have names that relate to geology. Quite often people, when they've got to decide their own name, they pick something that's got some geology to it. So not only is... Is stone law this idea of writing things down with tablets, but there's something about the deep relationship between people and rock and people and metal and tangible things. So people aren't named for flowers and they're not named for celebrities. They're named for stuff that endures through fifth seasons. And I think that's really clever, really nice, really interesting. And if you want to find out more about all these rocks and what they really mean and what they represent, it's kind of there for you. And actually, I did look up one. I'll see if I can just find it quickly in my notes. Um, there was one particular um, name for some for a pl for a person, I think, or a place which um, which has got links to the Bible and uh, is a gem of New Jerusalem. So. All throughout this story, if you want to dig into it, if you want it, there's layers and layers and layers of meaning and interest, and everything has been written and considered, which I think is absolutely brilliant. So the next thing I thought we should probably talk about is representation, because this was an area of the book that, again, probably when I read it first, I wasn't focused on, and it's also something that has become a lot more mainstream in terms of coverage in the last kind of year or so I suppose I think I probably read this over a year ago a year and a half ago maybe and that's looking at representation and there's several places in the novel where this happens um, we've got a character who is trans um, somebody that is born um, born with a male parts um, but identifies as a woman and there's a really horrible moment where they run out of the, um, the hormone suppressant which stops their beard from growing and, ha and is incredibly ashamed. Um, something that I really like about this novel and the people in it who are the, the person in it we're follow whose story we're following is that they've just got no judgment about anybody else's life decisions and even ends up in this kind of very strange relationship um, where she's sleeping with two men and it's not quite a love triangle because they don't all fancy each other. And it's not quite a menage a trois either, but it kind of is. Um, it reminded me in some ways of the menage a trois in Sense8, which again is quite um, kind of about freedom and about self-expression. But also it's a lot more complicated than that and there's a lot more going on. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think the representation of this is really interesting in terms of gender and identity. It seems like this is a world where people generally don't seem to care. It's an it's an area where people have perhaps been more enlightened. Now, please correct me in the comments that if I've forgotten a horrible moment where people are judged. But I think in general, it's an area of progress if this is our future, um, even though um, we've got this horrible system of oppression and control in, a, in other people's kind of personal um and protected characteristics, as we might say, in terms of the current language. So the other thing that was very really fascinating to me that was new, as a new take, um, was that because this is kind of post-apocalyptic, um, this is also a world that's kind of living in lockdown. Now, that's not something I was thinking about when I read this 18 months ago, but it really was st stood out to me um, this time. Um, because, yeah, it's uh, it's a bit of a thing, isn't it? So when um, so when the world's collapsing everywhere, um, places go into lockdown. They shut their doors. Everybody's walking around wearing masks. Now this obviously wasn't predictive, and it's a very different situation. 
But I suppose what it does do, and this is maybe something we'll talk about over the following months, and we'll probably cover on our YouTube channel elsewhere, is what's the connection between, and what's the, what's our response now, having gone through a global pandemic and lockdown, and seen how people behave in that context, compared to how fiction deals with it. And this is obviously a very extreme version, um, and these are this is a society that's kind of they're preppers essentially they're always prepared for something and where's the difference there between um, those kind of preppers and what um, and what's happened to us over the last six uh, 13 14 15 16 weeks because I think something that's been really nice about the world around us is that Lots of elements of dealing with something, a global catastrophe, have been about kindness, they've been about support, person to person, helping each other out. And we've seen, we have seen less of the kind of hoarding, protecting, I'm fine, deal with it yourself element. Despite the fact that the press likes us to believe that everybody's stockpiling loot paper all the time and keeping it for everybody else, there is a necessary element of panic there. But I, th I think I would probably not necessarily disagree with some of the kind of coverage of humanity in this book because it's a very different context but again it's something that I, when you're reading this you we can reflect on it in a different way than perhaps we did um, when it was published so I'm waiting to hear from you in the comments to see if there's other stuff you want to talk about I've kind of run through I suppose my my additional my, my list of stuff um, that I found quite noticeable. I've got probably one or two more things on my list, so if I start talking about those, drop some comments in, and uh, then we'll go on a little path. We've got about 20 minutes left to kind of get into some of those. So the other thing that really stood out to me was about blame. Um, now, it's notable, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this at the top, that Jemison, before she became a professional writer, was a psychologist, that's what her training was in, um, and, there's something very interesting there, perhaps also thinking about this, the second voice, the second person thing. There's something there that maybe comes across from psychology, which is about how you get into the mind of somebody else and tell them, maybe tell them things about their experience that they haven't managed to get themselves. That, so that's quite interesting. Um, but there's also there's something really here about blaming others to cover your mistakes. And that is something that for me kind of runs throughout the novel. Um, I find that really interesting and uh, yeah really fascinating um, kind of take on this society that's been created it feels very real that this is a thing that humans do anyway uh, and maybe this is something that um, we can talk a little bit about is um, that not only does the, the world of the stillness kind of feel like it as you know as, as Stephen says this could be our planet in the future but these also feel like real people. The reactions of people to things feel really genuine, and I don't know if that's partly because um, Jemison is a great writer, and partly because she studied how to study people, and then kind of was a psychologist or a counsellor. But they, people here feel, even the smaller characters, their responses don't feel like they're necessarily there for the plot. Even the characters who aren't necessarily human, they feel like they're having legitimate responses to stimuli. And that isn't something that I think always happens in fantasy. I think quite often with fantasy, it can read a bit like um, high myth. That's something it's responding to anyway. Whereas this could kind of be set today and the characters could go through similar things. It could be historical and they go through similar things. And it would feel pretty real to me. I think that's a real achievement. So yeah, if you want to chat about that, please drop that in the comments below as well. I'm just going to see if there's any other things that I think I think we should talk about. I mean, what do we think about people? What do we think about um, Jemison's kind of place in this fantasy fraternity? 
it feels to me like that it's a it's a world that maybe needs to do a lot more changing and I and recent events have perhaps highlighted that this is an issue um, and it's sad for me that even um, even amazing authors who've won awards perhaps still have this kind of experience so it'd be good to get your thoughts perhaps on how we can start to make a change as people that enjoy this kind of this genre and want to help it do better ah so Stephen's agreeing with me thank you Stephen um, they do feel like real characters rather than fantasy sci-fi archetypes now I should probably share my disclaimer is I didn't buy this book for myself um, Stephen who's commenting bought it for me as a gift I'm very happy he did so because it's brilliant um, if you ever want some recommendations then he's a great man because uh, he has some really really interesting ideas Ah, so he's also comments here, no hero saving the world or daring anti-hero smuggler. Yeah, so I guess we haven't talked much about tr tropes, I suppose. But yes, there is no hero here. Everybody's flawed. Nobody is um, on that hero journey, I guess. No one is starting as a small farm hand and ending up wielding a laser weapon to kill the big evil. Um, because there's kind of no big evil person there's no one person here that is the issue and and this is yeah this is this is a really great thing to talk about because most fiction has your hero and your kind of nemesis i suppose um but a lot most stories don't have um some people and a horrific structure of oppression and and misery that they're trying to take down perhaps along with that and um, thinking about the <laughs> thinking about the heroes and the anti-hero smugglers who can do the stillness run in less than 12 months um, is that uh, there are various structures of society and there are factions within them and all those factions are kind of competing with each other and against other factions and it's a complicated messy world but one of the skills of the book and all of the sequence is that that's never too complicated or too messy. Maybe it helps there's no trade federation negotiations to worry about driving the plot. But in general, um, we've got a nice through line. And actually, yeah, thinking about um, Essen and her journey, um, this, for me, it felt like a bit of a story of metamorphosis. Something here about the roles that people force us to be and the roles that we can create for ourselves um, and how much agency SN has in this experience is I think difficult um, at different points but this ties me back I suppose to that very first quote and this was about halfway through this kind of stood out to me I suppose so um, the quote again I'll read it very quickly but this is the way the world ends this is the way the world ends this is the way the world ends for the last time. So that's three of those, this is the way the world ends. And I think they not only represent, there's not only a kind of literary device to hammer home that this is really happening, but for me, these world ends iterations also represent the private worlds of our main character and their experience and their metamorphosis. So that, but this is the way the world ends is Damia's leaving home from the family, forgetting all that world that she knew, going somewhere else. That world is ending. This is the way the world ends, is um, Senites kind of break from the fulcrum and her training, uh, living on that island, uh, and then losing son and all the rest of it. And the kind of the cataclysm of the of being on that ship and all the rest of it. And this is the way the world ends. That final one is Essen's experience and Essen's world ending. So that's and that one is <clears throat> in italics in the book, and it perhaps represents two things. It represents the death of a son and that world that she's constructed for herself falling apart. But it's also that double one. It's the personal world and the physical world both ending at the same time, which is something really interesting.
So yeah, if you've got any comments on that metamorphosis, please let me know. So Stephen says in the comments, it's interesting how the races are portrayed in the book. In fantasy sci-fi, they're normally very archetypal, orcs, elves, etc. Even in our real world, with lump whole continents into simple words, black, Asian, etc. The fifth season world is a lot more nuanced. People are described by physical description and maybe location in the world they're from. Yeah, I, th I think this is really, really interesting. Um, and I suppose we didn't dig into that when we were talking about representation before. Um, there is a kind of constant... Um, there's a constant focus on what people look like from our main character in particular. And the and also other characters, I think, and how they relate to the standard. But yeah, it's maybe because there's one continent, so things are a lot more devolved. I think it's really fascinating. Yeah, everyone, as Steve says, everyone is black, apart from for some very notable, <laughs> I suppose, kind of creatures that aren't. Um, so yeah, you get into a lot more nuance about um, the different types, and I w I wondered there's there's something there I think about the history of the slave trade and enslaved people, particularly in America, and also perhaps something like um, Nazi Germany with Jewish people and how much Jewish heritage you had, about the degree that you are to what is seen as the standard and the and the elements of yourselves that don't fit with what you should be and and that really complicated mix then of identity and it and as Stephen says it's kind of as much about um, location it's about where you're from it as it is anything else but it allows us to think about some of those other wider issues within the context of you're kind of taking away one layer to allow to allow people to um, to investigate that layer, if that makes sense, or that issue, which I think is really clever writing. Yeah, Stephen says here, one continent, so everyone is intermingled, no continental boundaries. So <clears throat> perhaps one thing that Jemison is saying that is that, yeah, when you've got to a situation where there's one continent, everyone's intermingled, there's no continental boundaries, Human beings are going to find other things to judge each other on. They're going to find other ways to measure people and to um, to create differences. And that maybe this is something that's inherent in us as people and that we try and find differences to judge people on. Or maybe it's a situation of the world that they find themselves in, which is an unfair, unbalanced one. Um, I think the other thing that's probably quite clever about the way that um, because everyone is black is that it it means that the um, origins then the focus is on their difference which is a which allows her to show um, these structural powers um, yes yeah, even also mentions people are judged by cast and job um, I thought this was really interesting particularly maybe harking back to those resonances with the British Empire thinking about somewhere like India and their caste system that's what immediately it made me think about so what you do um, and the lineage of what you do and where you sit in society is another factor of how you are judged and controlled and managed by this kind of institutional structure which is there to control people and I do wonder whether, to some degree, the, obviously the fifth seasons are catastrophic, but they're also useful for people in charge because they are a mechanism whereby you can control people and keep them afraid of what's going to happen. And the the island where they go, um, which has got the benefit of being pretty um, of, of being pretty safe and secure, um, is also somewhere where they're just kind of they're kind of not worrying about it because they're maybe free of that the yoke of control of if you don't do this things are going to go bad for you in the next fifth season they're like it's going to happen we're just going to live our lives and be pirates they're pirates um steven also says the strongbacks thrown out of villages during fifth seasons but the admin is safe yeah and uh, we haven't talked about leadership actually I think that's a, that's another really fascinating strand which we probably won't have time to get into, particularly during uh, this session. But if you've got extra comments you want to add in or you want to tweet us things, then you can do that. Um, so 
yeah, leadership is true leadership is seen as a really important thing for this world. So strength is important, sure, um, and technical skills are important, sure, and storytelling is important, although within reason, I suppose, in this story. But what pe- what is really valued above everything else, and there is a quote from the tablets which I won't be able to find in a hurry, is that um, is that uh, true leadership, administrative skills, these are valued because they get you through the tough times. And maybe this is a, a plea from the author of the world that that's something that's taken a bit more seriously. You don't put strong backs in charge, you put leaders in charge. You don't, um, and there's that really interesting bit about talking about the village um, when um, Essen meets up again with Lerna. Towards the end, he says the person that inherited the leadership knew they were no good, so they wanted an election. <laughs> if only we lived in a world where people that knew they weren't good leaders stepped aside for others. That would be much more useful, I think. So we're drawing to the end of our time. Um, hope you've enjoyed hearing about this story. Um, as I said, you can watch this back in full on our Facebook channel. And also we now have a YouTube channel where we're going to upload these to. And we're also going to be posting more videos about other books that um, we love at Cosmic Festival. Uh, and hopefully the first one of those is going to be The Future of Another Timeline, uh, which I am about halfway through at the moment. It's another story which um, which has every passing week has got more relevance and more interest and is more important for the world that we live in. Um, so watch out for that. Uh, we are Cosmic Festival on there, so it's easy to find. The last thing that it remains me to do is to talk about next month's book. So that's going to be in July. And the book we've chosen is one that I haven't read. So you're going to get my first read experiences. Now this is a pretty thick book. So you're going to need a good amount of time to read it. And this is a book that I know very little about. It was a bit of an impulse purchase um, when I was in a well-known book chain um, earlier this year. And that is... Black Leopard, Red Wolf by Marlon James. I'm really looking forward to this. I think it's going to be, we're probably going to talk next month about maybe some of the thematic similarities and differences between both these books, but also perhaps something like Rosewater by um, Tally Thompson, which we covered in a physical Cosmic Festival reading club uh, last year. So that's Black Leopard, Red Wolf by Marlon James. I'm really looking forward to reading this. So join us for that. Um, If you've got any other comments or anything else, you can post them here on our Facebook page. You can leave, you can send us an email, the contact details are on our website, which is cosmiafestival.co.uk. And we hope you have enjoyed um, this process um, and we'll see you all very soon. Thanks and goodbye.